Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dane Menke. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager here at Regenesis and Land Science. Before we get started, I have just a couple administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If the webinar or audio quality degrades, please refresh your browser. If that does not fix the issue, please disconnect and repeat the original login steps to rejoin the webcast. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we don't address your question within the time permitting, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we will be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. Today's presentation will discuss the rapid remediation of hydrocarbon plumes and best practices for the design and application of Petrofix. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We are pleased to have with us Todd Harrington, Global Petrofix Product Manager for Regenesis. Todd directs the expansion of the new hydrocarbon treatment line in the global marketplace and provides industry-leading support to Regenesis customers. He has over 24 years of environmental remediation experience, fo primarily focused on in-situ remediation. He has been involved with thousands of contaminated site remediation projects during his tenure at Regenesis and has expertise with enhanced bioremediation, chemical oxidation, chemical reduction, and carbon sorption. We're also pleased to have with us today, Tyler Harris, Petrofix Design Specialist for Regenesis. Tyler leverages his microbiology experience and prior field experience as a Regenesis Remediation Services Scientist to design in situ remedial injection applications using Petrofix activated carbon to treat releases of petrochemicals in soil and groundwater. He's been with Regenesis since 2016. He earned his BS in biology from Mercer University and his MS in applied and environmental microbiology from Georgia State University. We're also pleased to have with us today, Steve Sittler, Senior Project Manager at Patriot Engineering and Environmental. Steve has 35 years of technical experience in applied hydrogeology with specialized experience in remedial strategy development and implementation. He has managed and performed hundreds of site investigations, audits, and assessments at industrial facilities, service stations, petroleum and chemical refineries, and landfills in more than 20 states, and has coordinated, designed, and managed more than 1,000 hydrogeological assessments and remediation projects involving both implementation of innovative closure strategies and unique applications of conventional technologies for petroleum, hydrocarbons, and chlorinated solvents. All right, so that concludes our introduction. Now I will hand things over to Todd Harrington to get us started. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate that. And I've been looking forward to this webinar on uh, best practices. The um, thinking it through the, the topic for this webinar came about uh, because as uh, Tyler and I and other people in Regenesis have helped people with Petrofix of years, the one thing that's unique about this technology is that it can be accessed through some online software. So, um, you know, when people are out doing it on their own, or even when we're working with them, there are some best practices that, that people should adhere to that really knock it out of the park. And so all three of us today are going to be touching on that. And I'm going to be talking uh, primarily on the uh, a, a brief update or overview on Petrofix for those who aren't familiar with it. And I'm going to get into design best practices uh, that should be used when you're using this software or even when we do it when we help people out. Tyler will be talking about sort of the in-field application best practices, some really great stuff, uh, tools, pumps, approaches in field. And then Steve uh, has uh, been a good customer and has done a great uh, site, an industrial case study he's going to talk about and some of his lessons learned too. Very exciting. So I'm going to jump right in. And I, I think some of you on this webinar today probably are not that familiar with Petrofix. So I want to spend a few minutes there covering that for you. So Petrofix is primarily an activated carbon 
that's milled down to the size of a red blood cell or one to two micrometers in diameter. Uh, it is unique in the industry. There's no other uh, commercial products that can do that. And it's so small and formulated in such a way that it can flood into a formation versus needing high pressure fracturing. It's also paired with a slow and rapid release of electron acceptor blends as nitrate and sulfate salts. And they're very easy to mix uh, in water. It's, it's shipped, Petrofix is shipped in totes or drums suspended in water. The electron acceptor is shipped in in uh, 20 pound pails, but mixing it is really easy. This is a um, something I did in the lab recently. Uh, that's Ryan Hardenberg on the left, and that's actually me on the right pouring the electron acceptor salt. Uh, not, you know, if you're putting this in a tank in the field, uh, easy to mix in a couple minutes, then start putting it down a rod or an injection well, uh, what have you, in the field. And so, what are the benefits of this? particular approach of putting uh, activated carbon of this size and electron acceptor salts together. Well, the first thing it does is it turns the, the subsurface into a purifying filter. It allows for no escape for contaminants to get by and it pulls them out of the groundwater. Um, because it's such a small activated carbon particle, it, it uh, lets us put it in the ground using low pressure injection. And we believe that low pressure injection, showing this cartoon on the upper right, gives you a nice even uniform flooding into the conductive zones of an aquifer versus say a high pressure fracture approach <clears throat> where you might have uneven um, uh, uh, fracture planes, et cetera. It does give you fast and persistent results. And for example, this is a, a beta site that we did early on. I showed this quite a bit, uh, not just this site, but a lot of sites we see these results where you put the Petrofix in and you get uh, dropped to say non-detect and it persists over time. So this is a terrific, this is why it's been such a great um, uh, fun on my part actually um, supporting this product. And because it persists, it treats back to fusion, it's safe around infrastructure. There's just so many different uses of it. People primarily use it for groundwater plumes, the source, the mid and the distal part of a plume. You can also use it in barrier configurations, uh, either grid barrier or, or barrier to help prevent offsite liability by primarily stopping a plume in its tracks. Uh, Petrofix, uh, before I forget to say, when you put it in the ground, even though it does inject something that looks like an ink, it does attach to soil and it stays in place after a few weeks or a few months. So uh, barriers do work and you can proactively treat sites, say recent spills or old spills to make sure that VOC plume doesn't go to where it's not supposed to go. In terms of applicability, what, what does it treat? Well, activated carbon treats uh, a lot in groundwater. You know, you know, most organics in groundwater will adsorb to, to uh, an activated carbon. However, in the case of Petrofix, we formulate it in a way when we combine the activated carbon with the electron acceptor blends, those electron acceptors are dialed in to promote anaerobic biodegradation. So we're really going after the hydrocarbons solely with this not solvents or anything like that. So BTEX, MTBE, PAHs, uh, the gasoline range, diesel range organics, the usual uh, LNAPL treatment. Uh, we're not going after that. We're primarily going after groundwater plumes. And so we see a lot of use at retail UST sites, uh, but really anywhere where you're storing, distributing uh, fuel is gonna be applicable. So any sort of commercial industrial location, railroads, airports, brownfields development, we've seen it all. In terms of how it works, let's talk about this quickly. So we're, you know, you intuitively probably have an idea on how activated carbon works. Uh, but the first mode of action is this, is when we inject the diluted Petrofix fluid and flood it through the aquifer, uh, the Petrofix itself attaches and coats to the soil. So this is an image on the lower left, a scanning electro, electron microscope image of Petrofix particles the size of bacteria that are adhered to the surface of a sand particle. Notice it's not clogging the aquifer, but it's really just surface adsorbed there. And once it's in place, once we flood inject into the aquifer uh, petrofix, uh, I've got an animation that shows this. Uh, we inject that flux zone with the petrofix. It clarifies eventually because it becomes attached to the soil itself. And if we zoom in, what happens then is that as dissolved contaminants migrate to that aquifer, 
they impact and adsorb to the petrofix particles. And when that happens, the great thing is that things will back diffuse, but they'll back diffuse into that petrofix. So petrofix is an excellent cleavement technology for back diffusion. The next thing that happens is that once that contaminant's attached, we're simultaneously kickstarting anaerobic biodegradation. Those, uh, the nitrate and sulfate that we supply are in limited supply and the bacteria will really respond to that. And as they respond, they actually do grow around the petrofix. They are able to degrade the hydrocarbon contaminants that are absorbed to it. When you degrade that, you regenerate that carbon. When you regenerate that carbon, you free up new sorption sites and you extend the life of that carbon. So it's that cycle uh, that we have that one-two punch of sorption and biodegradation with petrofix. So taking this liquid, a typical application would be source or plume grid treatment. Any part of the plume, we see that. Petrofix treats high and low concentrations effectively. We also see uh, a lot of use with barriers. I think I looked at that once. It might be one out of six or one out of seven sites incorporate some sort of a barrier in the design with Petrofix to prevent that contaminant from going where it needs to go, whether it's property boundary or towards a critical water body. And we see a lot of excavation polishes. So uh, this is a popular approach with other remedial chemicals within Regenesis as well, but Petrofix being new, people are liking the option to spray the activated uh, carbon of Petrofix in there with the electron acceptors uh, for that insurance policy for that excavation. I thought for fun, I'd mention a couple emerging approaches. This may be the topic of a US-based webinar down the road, but because Petrofix is a fluid and injects easily and it's non-corrosive, we did have a client inject it around active USTs at a site in Colorado, and we uploaded that website recently. So very effective at uh, being safe and cleaning up that tank basin pit contamination. We've also seen an increased use of Petrofix for heating oil type spills at residences where either you're trying to polish post excavation or you put in a barrier along the, the property line to prevent that heating oil spill uh, from going to where it needs to go, creating that headwick if it goes onto another property. And expanding up on that construction barriers, we've seen Petrofix replace slurry walls. Very exciting stuff. Petrofix adoption to date, uh, excited to say, released in September 2018, it's two and a half years old, yet it's been applied on 360 sites worldwide, 39 states and 12 countries. I think some of you might be wondering, you know, maybe somewhat excited um, about the information we're sharing today and then wondering, well, geez, can I get this applied? It's likely it's already been approved in your state, and if not, it's a simple UIC process. And if you've got any hiccups or needs uh, for technical uh, technology support for that, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help. All right, so I'm going to transition in. That was sort of my Petrofix update portion. Let's talk about uh, the, uh, the online software. It goes hand in hand with some of the best practices. Some of the best practices, we actually have algorithms built into the online software to give you safe designs. But if you go to Petrofix.com, you can access our software under the U Design option. If you, uh, this picture on the right actually shows a, um, this red uh, shows the U Design where you can click it or petrofix.com forward slash design will get you there. Go ahead and sign up, create an account. There's actually a YouTube video there that if you go through it, it's about nine minutes, 19 seconds long. And it will demonstrate you step by step how to open a site how to select input parameters such as surface areas, vertical injection intervals, selecting uh, grain size for your site. Even we'll show you how to order. And there is a lot of other stuff there. So if you bang around the site, um, I'm trying to make this the most well-supported product uh, in the industry. And I think we've actually achieved that with the number of application guidance documents, the number of available videos and webinars, uh, just fully supported with this, uh, just to make sure you're successful on that. When you get into the software, you're able to do this at any time, unlimited number of designs. The two options available for you design are an excavation and a grid at this time. So this covers most of everything. You do actually have a pull down option for a barrier, but it does request that at that point you 
uh, contact Regenesis for assistance on that. I do recommend that you don't go into the grid software and do a thin grid to come up with a barrier estimate. I, I do recommend that you maybe call Tyler and I, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And the software will allow you to handle any, you know, a broad weight of concentrations, high and low, you know, high PPM to low PPB, uh, multiple areas and treatment types at once, unlimited number of sites, and there's the de design rails that are built in. And then once you're done, you can get output for your work plans, remedial action reports, you can get cost summary, and you can get output summaries, which are important because you can send those off to an injection contractor for an injection bid and or use them yourself uh, if you're going to self-apply. If you've got any questions, Tyler and I, who are both speaking today, are full-time on Petrofix. We're here to do any Q&A. In fact, we uh, frequently have people reach out to us and just ask us to double check if their design uh, looks good to them or, you know, we're happy to uh, do some designs for any large complex sites. What's a large site? I don't know if anything's maybe over 100 injection points or really just anything that you think is complex or want our assistance. Uh, not only do we have the software, but we have our full support available to you as well. All right, so let's get into the, uh, the meat of this. I'm going to transition into the actual best practices. Um, I've got these listed out, and um, as I said earlier, the best practices came along just, uh, you know, seeing how people may, maybe made mistakes, uh, maybe how we've made mistakes in the past where you do an injection, you get results back, and, and they're just not what you want to see. So I hope this is really helpful. And I've put together eight, excuse me, I've put together eight best practices today. So the first best practice is this. So when we're doing a design and we're figuring out coverage or laying things out in the field, um, and by the way, my key design uh, best practices are not just with the software. They're, they go hand in hand with the software and also in field layout. Um, place the grids with an appropriate coverage and barriers and an appropriate alignment and distance to wells. So let me flush this out. So this this uh, diagram that I have here, I'm going to say is a good application of Petrofix. It's something hypothetically where a person has come in and done just a source treatment and a barrier near a property boundary and a property boundary well. Notice the overlap, notice the tight grid, notice that none of the wells are stranded. They're, they're by and are going to see the effects of the Petrofix in the grid itself, right here where my cursor's at. In comparison, um, these are examples of things that I've seen where somebody has actually done a fairly nice job of treating a source area, but they'll leave a gap either because of infrastructure or just making mistake. They might miss a well on the side and they don't cover and they're not gonna see results of incoming or contamination in this area. So that could be a bit of a problem. So be careful and make sure that you cover all the wells. I mean, you don't want to spend a lot of time doing this source injection, and then the one or two wells that you're using to monitor that just are not giving you the results that you need. You can have the same thing happen when you have grid gaps. Just be attentive to that. If you accidentally stretch things out with gaps in between and there's a critical well between the gaps, could it could appear as non-performance even though you're doing a great job remediating the rest of the plume. Another thing, when I said earlier, is that make sure the barriers are in appropriate alignment and distance to well. Let's talk about distance. If you put a barrier in, you want to make sure that that barrier is within probably about five feet, no more than 10 of a monitoring well. And why would I say that? Um, it has happened before where people will do an application of Petrofix on, say, one side of a road, and then 30 to 40 feet on the other side of the road, they've got the monitoring well they're looking for. When you inject, your client um, may not understand hydrogeology and all that, and it may actually be three to six months before you see the sweep effect of Petrofix come through, uh, but that, that could be a problem having the weight. So keep that in mind that proximity to a well for a barrier does matter. And alternately, just having a good handle on the groundwater flow direction. I have seen times where uh, flow directions off, people will put in a barrier, or they won't put in a wide enough barrier, and you could either get a complete mist, missing the particle flow path, or a glancing blow at the site. So hopefully that uh, makes sense. These next two design tips, I'm going to go into design tip number two, are 
nuances of this first one. The uh, second design tip too is use, I recommend that you use our recommended spacing in the software because that's gonna help you attain complete coverage and overlap. I'm gonna say something a little surprising. It might be a surprising to some of you that uh, at Regenesis, we, we strongly support um, on center spacing around five to six and a half foot on center spacing, depending on soil type. It's gonna be tighter for clays, looser for sand and gravels. And when you use that spacing, this purple um, diagram on the right is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get that good overlap. The problem is if you don't do that, it's gonna, you're gonna leave gaps. And then I've noticed that some people in industry, you know, think that 10 or 15 foot on center is okay that you can get away with it, but you risk non-contact. If you do that, there's lots of room for contaminants to get by to appear to be non-performing or actually non-performing in a well. So uh, just be aware of that. And if you think that you can spread the spacing out, I'm supportive of that uh, as long as that you can um, document the ability to do so using some distribution testing. And Tyler's actually gonna touch on that uh, on his portion of the talk. Key design tip number three, nuance of the prior two, as I said. So not only would, would we, do we recommend that you adhere to the uh, spacing, we would uh, recommend that you adhere to our pore space filled. So what do we mean by that? So when, we, uh, when you do a design online and when we do designs, the amount of water that we choose is sufficient to dilute that petrofix. And when you place it in a point to spread it, so it has an ROI, they can overlap with the other adjacent point. And to do that, uh, typically we're finding that we need to be injecting about 50 to 60% of the effective pore space of an aquifer. And by effective pore space, what we mean, I didn't mean to blip ahead here, is that that's the interconnected pore space. It's different for sand, say this an animation on the left, as for a clay, uh, we will use different, um, porosity assumptions, but when we get that porosity, we do want to fill about 50 to 60% of that up. If you don't do that, you risk uh, kind of similarly what happens if you spread the points out too far, your product's just not gonna go far and you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get gaps. Key design tip number four. So this is a, you know, talking a lot about distribution testing. I would say our design tip number four is when you do this and you're getting your bids, um, plan for time for distribution verification. I like to say to my clients that think of your site as dynamic and not static. There's a, a challenge in our industry where say an advanced technology vendor like Regenesis uh, provides a design and people try to adhere to that to the strictest measure in the field. But a lot of times, you know, the sites or maybe the porosities, things change. It's okay to make micro adjustments. If you can think of that that way and, and build in a half a day or a day of extra time to do this testing, to making these micro adjustments, uh, you're gonna be very happy with the results. And those results mean that you're seeing petrofix spread in soil. Notice this is considered a successful distribution of petrofix, a full flood without seams, we're getting overlap, or seeing it in monitoring wells, something that you want to go for. Key design tip number five is um, it's along the line of be willing to use the uh, features of the software to break your site into multiple compartments or multiple grids if needed. A lot of times you don't need to do that, but if you have a, a large enough site where say you have an order of magnitude difference between one well or another, let's say the source here up here at MW4 is very hot with wells and you have lower concentrations here and even lower concentrations here, go ahead and reap the benefit of being able to do that in the software and reducing the amount of petrofix that needs to be ordered. So I do see this as a good design tip uh, for just uh, effective designs for you. Key design tip number six, we just have three more and then I'll hand it off to Tyler, is to try to inject over the entire saturated screen interval of your aquifer. Uh, this is this is problematic. Uh, this happens more times than I than I like to see. The problem is, is if you inject in the wrong interval, you risk wasting petrofix and missing contaminants that may be fluxing into that well. 
So what I'm showing here on the right is a, a boring log. Uh, this was actually a site that Tyler was working on. And this boring log, um, in determining the vertical injection interval based on our criteria, we would, we would recommend that you inject roughly one foot above groundwater table to below the well screen. So in this example, you know, we're injecting about 11 feet below ground surface and going down to about 19 feet, just under 20 feet below ground surface. Alternatively, this is an example of somebody that maybe shifted the groundwater level up or down, either accidentally or just weren't being attentive in the design. Here's the problem. If you've got a low flow approach and you put the tube down in this well and you say come down to 16 feet, you're in an untreated area and there's likely to be some flux coming through there. That's a big reason why we're, we're saying make sure you go over the entire saturated screen interval. A quick advanced refinement is uh, to always be attentive to your boring logs. If you see parts of your boring log that have high PID readings, which are indicators of high mass in that location, which would be indicators of probably high flux, definitely make sure that you're injecting over those zones. If you really want to sort of geek out and, and refine your design, you can uh, target that smear zone more aggressively, either by doing a separate design for that or adjusting your total volume so you're putting more volume in this upper zone when you apply the Petrofix. All right, key design tip seven, another important one. When you're applying, when you're putting your key design variables in, uh, not only in the online software, but you know when we're doing these offline, just make sure that you add everything up, that we're putting in all the contaminant concentrations. Um, this is an input panel of the actual software. I've noticed that uh, many, um, many times clients are regulated on their site only for benzene, and then they tend to put benzene in as the only contaminant. And that risk underdosing, that's the problem, because there's a lot of other hydrocarbons in the groundwater that absorb and take up room on that petrofix. So this lower right one is a good example. Uh, one thing that we do recommend you put in is TPH gasoline range or diesel range organics. It helps account for all those alkanes and other contaminants that we don't normally account for that do uh, take up carbon and we do need to account for in our isotherm calculations. By the way, there are no rules of thumb that we're using. Um, Petrofix is calculated on straight carbon isotherms and the contaminants that we put in, uh, that you put in. And final design tip is large sites don't often need aggressive full coverage, consider grid barrier approaches. Uh, I've alluded to this um, on uh, earlier, you know, earlier slides. And the idea is that if we get into big sites, and this is something that Tyler and I spent a lot of time helping with, that could be a lot of days in field, a lot of injection points and a lot of water that may not be necessary. Here's an example of say a 20,000 square foot plume. Say hypothetically, it takes 470 injection points, 100,000 gallons plus of water, you know, if we could start changing the approach based on, you know, maybe allowable risk-based standards, your, your specific remedial conceptual model, or even just carve that down to a source treatment in a barrier, uh, we could save 50, 60, 70 percent of your total remediation cost. We see that uh, routinely at sites. So that would be a time to maybe raise your hand, reach out to Tyler and I for that final design tip. So there's certainly many more, but I think these were eight important ones just to throw out to everybody. And with that, I wanna transfer over and let Tyler uh, give uh, for Tyler. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. As Todd mentioned, I'll be talking about best practices in the field. That's going to look, uh, that's gonna be addressing injection tooling, flow rates and pressures, and then some QA and QC things that we can do to determine that we are getting that distribution in the field that's vital. So first, addressing tooling. Uh, since bottom up is what most sites are going to be using, my number one recommended tooling is going to be a retractable screen. These are really useful because they have multiple ports, uh, 360 all the way around the tooling, and they come in a variety of heights. So it allows you to get a good distribution, both vertically and horizontally at the same time, saving you a lot of field time. 
Uh, these do come in a variety of lengths from one foot to five foot. I recommend staying in that two to three foot area. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that these are great for bottom up. They are not very effective for top down. For top down, I recommend something similar called an internal screen. These are similar in that they come in a variety of uh, lengths, I believe two and four foot. Uh, I recommend sticking with the two foot. Um, and they also have multiple ports all the way around that vertical distance as well. The difference here is instead of having a uh, metal sheath protecting those ports, these have a internal slotted screen that prevents any debris from entering inside of the tooling. Uh, the downside to that is that makes these difficult to clean at times. Uh, they can be easily cleaned with a pressure washer, however. It's important whenever you're on site to have a plan B when it comes to your tooling. Uh, I recommend always on site having expendable tips available to you, regardless of whether you plan to do uh, bottom up or top down. That said, expendable tips are only effective in a bottom up method. Expendable tips are great because they're rather cheap they're incredibly durable and they're the most reliable tooling out there in the sense of you can troubleshoot them while they're in the ground and, and get them working you don't have to pull all of your tooling out of the ground to uh to see what the problem is the downside of expendable tips is that they inject straight down uh for a plan b for top down applications i recommend having pressure activated tips pressure activated tips uh, they are go they are similar to the internal screens, only instead of having an internal screen in there, there is a ball and spring mechanism that protects those ports from being clogged up as you're drilling. The downside of a pressure activated tip is that they are much less durable and they only cover, they only have about four ports and they cover a very small vertical area. For that reason, we don't recommend applying more than one foot at a time with this tooling. Um, they can be very effective whenever you have a lot of banding and treating small vertical sections of that banding that way. So when we're thinking about pumps, or when we're thinking about pumping, people often think about speed. I think we need to refocus that to think about how hard you're pumping rather than how fast you're pumping. Your pressure should be driving your flow rates rather than your flow rates driving your pressure. The reason for that, as Todd mentioned, we don't want to pump so fast that we're causing fracking. Uh, that's going to create new preferential pathways and not get us a even coding on the lithology. And we also don't want to have too low of a pressure because that pressure is going to help ensure that we get that vital horizontal distribution. Uh, keep in mind, Petrofix is a contact sport. It has to make contact in order to work. So I provided here some general guidelines on pressures to expect for uh, for finer lithologies and for coarser lithologies. These aren't a rule to live by. This is just to kind of direct you to the area the target's at. Your site's going to vary. This is just going to show you um, kind of a range to think about. Now, if you're having surfacing, it's okay to lower your pressure down some to help limit and prevent that surfacing. What we want to avoid, however, is that uh, we don't want to do gravity feeds. Um, it's better to have a little bit of surfacing with some pressure, as long as that can all be controlled, rather than have no surfacing and no pressure. Um, to help prevent surfacing, often a lot of these sites are going to have to be pre-cleared. To help prevent that surfacing, I recommend having at least three feet of bentonite. If you're air knifing, that's very common, but air knifing is going to cause a lot of problems in your injection. It's going to cause a lot of damage to the native lithology and loosen everything up. Um, so if you are air knifing, definitely use more bentonite. You may also want to look into a uh, bentonite grout mixture to help seal that up a lot more effectively. And similarly, if you're going to be injecting within three feet of the bottom of your pre-cleared area, 
I recommend adding more than that original three feet of that night. When we're looking at what pumps to bring on site, uh, it's important to make sure that you have the right pump that's able to push hard enough. So I recommend having a pump that's able to do greater than 150 PSI, but also something that you're able to control the speeds on. While a double diaphragm pneumatic pump is a great pump, they max out at about 70 PSI. So that's going to be absolutely not useful for a lot of sites. Similar with a Moino pump, while those can do a whole lot of pressure, there's not really a safe, easy way to control that speed effectively. So we need something that falls in the middle of those. And that's going to play a major role in make sure that we are getting that distribution because pressure is critical in getting that distribution. So how we know that we are getting that in the field rather than just trusting it, we need to do some QA, QC testing. Um, now, whenever you're selecting where to do your testing at, keep in mind that these designs are intended to take the entire project as a whole, not just a single injection point. So when you're deciding where to take your samples at, whether that is through groundwater or through soil testing, make sure that you're triangulating that position between two to four injection points. And that's going to get you the most realistic example of what's going on on site. Sorry about that. So I recommend going with groundwater testing over soil boring testing for a couple of reasons. The biggest one is going to be that groundwater is a lot easier to do in a qualitative manner, or sorry, in a quantitative manner. Uh, every, every shipment of Petrofix should come with a testing kit, and that can be used to determine how much Petrofix is actually in your groundwater. This is critical because there's a big difference between 300 ppm of Petrofix and 3000 ppm of Petrofix. 300 is probably not going to get the results you're looking for. 3000 is a much, much better uh, end result to, to your injection. And again, I provided some guidance here as to what to expect. Again, this is not something to live by. This is something to just point you in a general direction here. Um, also, whenever we're using groundwater sample, the electron acceptor that is mixed in with the Petrofix will move further and faster than the Petrofix itself. So that can be used as an additional marker by monitoring conductivity. So, if you are using groundwater and you're using the wells that exist on site, that eliminates some of the vertical understanding, but gives you a really good horizontal understanding. So how we do vertical understanding, one solution to that is going to be through soil borings. Soil borings, uh, we're going to be looking for this complete, even vertical coverage, as we see in the picture on the left there and not the banded coverage that we see on the right where there's only a small section of that that's covered. Um, there are situations where we may actually be wanting banded coverage. In the case, if you had um, a highly permeable area and a very low permeable area, like a coarse sand sitting between two layers of a tight clay, uh, you can expect some banding in those situations because that uh, that clay is not going to receive as much petrofix, and that's not where the bulk of your contamination is going to be flowing through. So that's an okay situation. However, soil borings can be a little bit deceptive. Um, the sandier the lithology, the longer it takes for petrofix to bind to them. It does happen sometimes that whenever you take a soil boring in a sandier lithology, you push out some of the petrofix that's already present there. Uh, so you can end up with a soil boring that looks like you have zero influence, but if you put a baler down that hole, your, uh, your groundwater would come out very dark. For that reason, um, that's why I would recommend leaning towards groundwater as opposed to soil borings. Groundwater is just a lot more 
uh, reliable and consistent and you can measure it a lot better. Uh, so the solution to that vertical issue is multiple uh, multiple temporary wells at a variety of depths around a single treatment area that will get you a really good effective understanding that you are getting great horizontal and vertical distribution and you can measure how well that distribution actually is. We have additional uh, material on YouTube and the Petrofix website. There are presentations going through a pre-application uh, going into much, much more detail than what I did today about all of these topics. Uh, there are also uh, instructional videos on the application itself. We also have written up guidelines on the Petrofix website for direct push, groundwater injections, excavation applications, and uh, general sampling guidance as well on, on the website. With that said, I will pass it on to Steve. Thanks, Tyler. I'm going to be talking about a site in northern Indiana where we did a Petrofix design and injection, also included a pilot test, which a, a regulatory agency asked us to talk about, and it's been very successful and we're moving uh, well on to closure. Uh, the site, as I said, is in northern Indiana. It's a sole source aquifer underneath it that uh, supplies all the water for the cities of South Bend and Elkhart and the surrounding areas. Uh, that was This site was a former bulk petroleum storage facility, it had a lot of above ground tanks and a handful of underground tanks, uh, as well as multiple racks and dispensing areas like most bulk plants have. It operated, as you can see on the slide, from 1917 to 2002. USTs were taken out in the mid 80s when UST regulations came along and the ASTs eventually came down a couple years after the facility was closed. There were multiple other petroleum releases as well as a couple chlorinated releases in the immediate vicinity of the site, which that complicated it a little bit, but more from the standpoint of the petroleum than the chlorinated. They were pretty clearly uh, from other areas. There was only one, one area kind of offsite to the Northwest that was disputed whether it belonged to this site or a gas station across the street. But in any case, um, th that's the background of the site. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a sole source aquifer. It's a sand, coarsening downward sand, which is typical of outwash, uh, glacial outwash sediments in this part of Indiana. It's kind of a unique area in Indiana with the um, with the the big sand aquifer like that. But the uh, water table is unconfined. The depth of water ranges anywhere from 17 to 22 feet, and it does fluctuate um, two to three feet. Sometimes we've seen a couple of occasions even more than that. Um, depending on precipitation. So it can rapidly, because of the, of the direct recharge, it can rapidly cause a water table to go up and down, which as you'll see later on, um, did cause some flushing of contaminants that previously may have been uh, absorbed to the soils and had to be treated by the petrofix. Groundwater flow direction is generally toward the northeast, towards the local river. It's a real flat gradient. Um, only 0 0.001, so you have a pretty slow groundwater velocity of only 35 to 45 feet a year. So this told us that we were going to be able to have a pretty long residence time with the material moving through the petrofix barriers that we ended up putting in and gave us a good feeling that that would probably work because of that. It wasn't just rushing through at a, at a real high rate. There were some historical remedial efforts at the site. A, a previous consultant back in the 2007 to 2009 had tried a, some air sparge soil vapor extraction. You can see some of the lines that they had running off site. They had some horizontal wells, which I don't think really did a lot of good because they weren't deep enough. Uh, they did some LMAPL recovery on site back in 2006 with an internal combustion engine system. and removed most of the free product. We did have a little bit out there when we got involved um, because of some property disputes and insurance, et cetera. There wasn't any site activity from 2010 to 2017. Uh, if you can look at this map here, this is kind of a layout of the approximate extent of petroleum VOC impacts. 
Uh, the site's down there on the bottom. The plume goes off site to the north, northeast, uh, across another property, across a street, a major street, and onto the properties to the north, which um, actually has, that's where one of the chlorinated solvent plumes is. So we inadvertently helped clean up their plume a little bit, but um, there were releases at the site from both ASTs and USTs. There was a tiny amount of free product left on the site in a couple wells. Um, and there was some impacts to the Northwest, which really ought not to have been there that had to do with the, with the gas station that was up in that corner of the site. So that was kind of an issue that we had to deal with and address as part of our cleanup. Um, but it was, it, it was what it was and there's nothing we could really do about it at the time we got involved with the site. So in order to implement this uh, at the state, the state is very familiar with, um, with Regenesis products and this long history of success that Regenesis has had in bringing products to market, um, going all the way back to ORC in the late 90s, uh, up through the other chemicals that have been involved. So they, they were not hesitant at all to allow this to be used as an approach. However, because we were, it, it was a product, specific product that was new, they wanted us to take a look at it and see uh, from a pilot test standpoint, how well it was likely to work. So we did a beta test out at the site, which was also a pilot test that not only helped Regenesis refine some of the last minute things on the product, but it also gave us an idea of where it was gonna work. So. We did this site up in the northwest corner of the plume, kind of along an old abandoned railroad track where we had um, some pretty high concentrations of VOCs and TPH, as you can see there on the slide. Uh, we did 12 points kind of around the one well there. It was PMW 36, injected about 2,000 pounds of Petrofix. And that was all part of this, again, the pilot test, the beta test that was done prior to um, the work being started. You can see the results here. Um, very quickly, within a month after the material was injected, the TPH concentrations fell off, you know, basically to nothing or to very little. Um, TPH GRO in particular, we did have a spike later on there that you can see, which was because of a huge groundwater um, fluctuation event caused by a record rainfall in February 19. So we think that just flushed out some material, but as you can see, it kind of took care of that. Um, even though the Petrofix had been in the ground for a while, it was still working. Um, the BTEX results showed similar, um, similar concentrations, knocking it down to nothing, a little spike there in the uh, early 2019 with the record rainfall and then dropping back off again. So that was very encouraging. Um, to tell us that our, our, our pilot test was going to work. Um, we did some borings around the, uh, in between the points where we injected to show that the Petrofix was indeed spreading throughout the formation. Um, you can see here from the graphs at the right, nitrate was used up first, followed by sulfate. And we did see some increased methane production from biodegradation that lasted well after that. So we were very pleased with that. The, the pilot test, uh, in our opinion, was very successful, showed that it would be, be able to be implemented throughout the site. Um, we did have microbial and geochemical data that we collected also, which I'll show you here in a second, but we thought it would be a good approach for the site in a, in a long-term um, situation. So the full-scale application that we had involved um, multiple areas where we did injection. Again, it's a high permeability aquifer. Um, we had pretty widespread impacts across the site, mostly higher near the site and decreasing off site, but as much as 50,000 parts per billion of total petroleum VOC. So that, those are pretty high levels to, you know, to treat with a carbon injection, but we felt like with Petrofix, with its supplemental bio, in addition to just the carbon entrapment, that it would be a good approach and a good way to do it. So this was the design for the Petrofix injection areas. Um, we, we had multiple individual injection areas, which taken together kind of formed a, a barrier perpendicular to groundwater flow, 
it wasn't a straight, per, a perfectly straight line barrier, but it, it kind of dodged around. But if you look at all the in, individual injection locations, you can see it's a pretty much a barrier across the whole plume. And the volume at each area was based on the concentrations of the wells in that area and the, the dimensions of the barrier that we put in. We did have one area on site where we had really high concentrations of, of hydrocarbons that pre gave us a, a number in Petrofix that we were uncomfortable with. So we decided to knock that down with a persulfox ORCA injection first and then come back with Petrofix. And that way give the Petrofix a better chance of being successful in that source area. So this was a full scale injection. You can see some pictures of it there on the left and then the, the little purple areas on the right, uh, plus the, the well, the little blue area in the upper left, that was where we did the, the beta test or the pilot test. Little purple boxes are other barriers and then the, the tan box is where we did the persulfox ORC injection to begin with. Um, the gentleman there holding up the baler, that's something we always do when we inject near monitoring wells is to see if it comes into the well. And obviously you can see that baler is black. Um, it's full of Petrofix. So we were confident that the spacing that we were using was adequate to distribute it throughout the formation. And you can see some of the mixing and stuff going on there um, at the site. So we come to the results. Um, you can really see that uh, the concentrations when we did the full scale injection fell off a ton. And we did have we did have spikes, and we've continued to have spikes because of the high water table fluctuation in this area. But it, that doesn't seem to be a problem because we're knocking our we're knocking our plume down 80 to 90 percent, almost 100 percent in some areas. And that was our goal was not to clean it up to drinking water, but to knock it down enough that we can show that the plume is stable and that we know that these these petrofix barriers are going to remain in the ground for an extended period period of time essentially indefinitely and will continue to treat the groundwater that migrates through them so you know a, a huge success there looking at some of the different wells that were there and um happy with the the fact that the when we did see spikes because of these rainfall and fluctuation events that they were they continued to be treated and it went down as we went along. Um, this is another example of some of the some additional data that we got um, along there shows the same thing, same kind of uh, results with diff for different parameters. Um, and, and again, this is for naphthalene. Um, looking at the area is about 99% reduction. And some some parameters higher than others. Um, some are more difficult to degrade than others, but um, we are pretty happy with the results. Uh, that when that injection took place, uh, it really wiped it out, and we haven't seen any any significant rebound that is not easily explained by a little desorption during rain events. Uh, we did do one supplemental injection, which one of them was planned. That was the injection there in the on site, um, the one with the white arrow. That was where we had done the persulfox ORC injection. So. It was always intended that we'd come back and put some Petrofix in there. Uh, we did also add an area down at the leading edge of the plume at the request of the client. Um, I don't think that necessarily would have had to been done, but the client wanted to do it. And we had $40,000 left over uh, that we had saved during the initial injection by getting things done quickly and efficiently. So we were able to add that without uh, asking the uh, providers for or the responsible parties for additional money. And that is supplemental injection was completed in December 2019. Um, once again, here's some data that shows kind of how the, you know, as we started to see so, uh, a little bit of an increase there in the on-site area, uh, we got that second Petrofix injection. And that's, you know, starting out at a 25 to 30,000 part per billion level, it's wiped it down to essentially nothing in, in just a, a couple of years. How much did this cost? Well, here's some quick numbers. Um, we did have to do about $100,000 of additional assessment, which involved replacing monitor wells that had been damaged and putting together a plan, developing this plan, doing the pilot test. Um, you can see the cost there. Um, you're looking at about $300,000 for the total remediation cost and about $100,000 to do the total monitoring costs, which were a little over, um, 
two years into the monitoring, we've got about a year to go. So that's a pretty reasonable amount for a site of this size. I, I think any other approach you might have used that would involve uh, any kind of mechanical remediation would have been significantly higher than that. You'd have been looking at cost uh, since you'd have had to have things off site probably that much just to build the system, let alone operate it. So it was a very cost-effective approach for this site. Um, the clients that we had that were involved in having to pay for it were very pleased with the number that they got. They had expected much worse. And they're also, as you can expect, very pleased with the results as they're going along because we're, we've already re reduced by you know 85 to 95% or more the concentrations and our plume stability is a uh, model or, or data that we're collecting is clearly going to be able to show that the plume is stable when we're done and that we've addressed most of these areas. Some of the lessons that we learned here on this project was that Petrofix is effective on really high concentrations. We, you know, we were a little bit, um, I don't want to say concerned, but we were curious as to how well it would work on 40, 50,000 part per billion total hydrocarbon concentrations, but it worked great. And, you know, we took care to make sure the Petrofix designs were conservative. We, you know, we, we stuck to the spacings that were recommended in the design. And, um, you know, it's always tempting to move the spacing out a little bit, get fewer points, reduce the cost, but that's not a good idea we found. I, we, the spacing, that's the, the design is cons in, in the, the Petrofix spreadsheet is good. It's conservative, and it, but it's based on reality. And if you if you play with it too much without a lot of really good site-specific data, such as a pilot test, um, you, you may not have it work as well as you will if you just use the data that's or the the estimates that are in there. So we saw sustained capture with a single injection, as you saw from the um, the spikes that went came up and went away. And it was obviously much more rapid reductions than a mechanical remediation system with no O&M. All we got to do is go out there and do our quarterly sampling and let it go from there. Um, we did find out that, you know, be, being able to document how well the material could be ejected and distributed using our soil borings and observations was a valuable technique. We do that all the time um, on a routine injection, even if it's not a pilot test or a study of some kind. We always use take a few borings in between points when we're starting out to make sure that the material is spreading out like it should. And we always look at nearby wells to see if the material is showing up. So um, again, putting these, uh, these barriers in strategic locations and lengths allowed us to avoid putting a single barrier all the way across the site in multiple locations, treating some of the hot spots that were present and allowing us to get to the point where when we complete our three years of monitoring, we'll be able to have enough data to show that the plume is stable and that we're pretty well done. So again, it was a very uh, a very successful application. It's the software that's available is good. If, if, if you collect your information up front to appropriately complete that software, uh, it'll spit out numbers that will be good and, and you'll have a successful injection. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the guys and have questions if anyone has one. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. That does conclude the formal section of our presentation. So at this point, we'd like to shift into the question and answer portion. Before we do this, just a couple of quick reminders. First, you'll receive a follow-up email with a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback, so please take a minute to let us know how we did. Also, after the webinar, you will receive a link to the recording as soon as it is available. All right, so let's circle back to the questions here. Uh, first question is a question for Steve, and it is, uh, did you have trouble getting it approved? Uh, the, the short answer to that is no, and I think that is because of, of two things. Number one, Regenesis has a long reputation of success um, with the products that they bring to market. They don't throw things out there without having a lot of testing to be sure that they'll work. The state is familiar with a lot of other Regenesis products that have been used, so they assumed that it would work, but because we were doing a, something a little unconventional with multiple barriers in a large area, they did ask us to do the pilot test, and 
conveniently it worked out that Regenesis was looking to do another beta test as the product was being developed and, and being ready to be pushed out to the market. So that, that was fortuitous for us. We were able to do that. And because of that, uh, because of Regenesis's strong reputation in Indiana with successful products and because of our, um, our demonstrated successful pilot test, when we turned our remediation work plan again, they actually approved it in less than 30 days, which was almost kind of unheard of in Indiana, but they were prepped for it by the discussions we had had and by the history of both Patriot and Regenesis and working on the sites like this. All right, thanks, Steve. So um, here is a question for Todd, and it is, uh, you mentioned in tip number six, to inject over the entire saturated interval. What if the water table is variable and how does that influence the injection interval? Yeah, that's good. So when I explain that slide, uh, we have a rule of thumb and regenesis already to inject about a foot above the water table. So in most situations, a lot of times the aquifers are not going to vary all that much and you don't have to worry about it. You know, if it's a half foot to a foot, we've got it covered. I would say if, if you're talking two, three, or four, you know, feet, obviously, that's going up and down and up and down in the smear zone, you know, more than likely, and that's in the saturated interval, uh, a couple of things you can do that are going to help. I would, you know, try consider injecting at high water. And, you know, a lot of times that's seasonal and can be predicted, and that'll help out a lot. Um, if you can't do that, I would go ahead and inject then up to high water. Um, so, for instance, let's say, uh, water may go as high as maybe 12 feet below ground surface, but a lot of times it's really down at 12 to 15. You can inject up to 12 if it's up there for a few months in the year. I think that's going to help. The Petrovix may not fully set in that area, but it may pillow down a little bit, and you're going to have more of a cushion, sort of a, a Petrovix carbon cushion that I think will really help. So those are two approaches that I would I would take in that situation. All right. Thank you very much, Todd. So that is going to be the end of our chat questions. Uh, if we did not get to your questions, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. If you'd like to learn more about environmental consulting services from Patriot, you can visit patrioteng.com. If you'd like to learn more about remediation solutions from Regenesis, please visit regenesis.com. Thanks again very much to Todd Harrington, Tyler Harris, and Steve Sittler. And thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.